Hello and welcome to this week's This Smart Lunch and Learn webinar. Our weekly webinars are aimed to provide advice and share knowledge amongst business owners on key business topics and specialist areas. This is part of our service to our Smart Room members. If you are not already a member or a BizSmart client and would like to have access to our archive of webinars, then please visit our website, biz-smart.co.uk and go to the Smart Room page. Our host joining me today is Kevin Brent, BizSmart's founder. But before we start our webinar, can I ask you all to use the question mark function on your screen to post any questions that you may have and Kevin will answer them all at the end of the session. Thank you, Kevin. Over to you. Thank you, Caroline. Fantastic. So, yep, the topic of today's webinar, cash acceleration strategies. So let's, let's start by asking a question which I hope shouldn't be too taxing. So what's more important, turnover, profit or cash? Well, I would hope very much that most of you would say that cash is the most important thing. Most people will be familiar with this well-worn phrase uh, about turnover being vanity, profit sanity, and cash is reality. But I don't know whether people have really thought that all the way, all the way through. And it's certain that you can get by with a decent strategy and some hard work in business, but you certainly can't get by without the, without the cash. And there are many profitable businesses, and when I say profitable, I'm in accord to their profit and loss statements, that have run out of cash and, and have come to a grinding halt. And as a business scales, and a lot of what Bismarck is about is helping businesses scale, then cash becomes even more critical as that business scales up. Because generally, cash is required for growth, so growth sucks cash. According to Jim Collins, great companies choose to keep three to ten times more cash reserves than their competitors. And there's many reasons why they might want to do that. It allows them to weather storms, particularly. And that's the major reason, reportedly, that Bill Gates mandated that Microsoft keep a year's worth of operating expenses in the bank. Now, that might seem a bit of a pipe dream for most of us. But the principle stands. So the question becomes, how do we manage to get to the point where we're able to hold some cash and the right amount of cash in reserve? And generally, aiming for something like two months' worth of operating expenses in cash in the bank is an excellent target. And that's after you've allowed for any tax obligations that you may have, so any, any VAT or any uh, annual tax returns that you've, that you've got. So in this webinar, what I'm going to take a look at is improving our cash conversion cycle. That's something so named by Vern Harnish and his team at, at Gazelles. And then I'm going to take a look at seven financial levers to improve cash and retain profits within the business. And we'll look at a couple of tools, a couple of templates along the way to help keep on top of, top of cash. So let's introduce that cash conversion cycle first of all. And, and most businesses will have some aspect of all of these elements. Even if, even if it's a service business, we're going to have a, an inventory cycle as well in terms of maybe underutilized staff. So we all, every business has a sales cycle, every business has a kind of a make or produce type cycle. We've all got a delivery cycle that we're, where we're actually delivering the product or the service to the customer. And then we generally have a payment, a, a, payment, a billing and a payment cycle at, at the end. Now, every business has some form of, uh, of these elements. What will differ in each business might be the length of these, uh, of these particular cycles, and some will have them overlapping in slightly different ways. But what's, what's important to get a hold of is that during this whole cycle, the cash in the business is basically tied up. So if you want to be able to scale, then you're going to need to minimize the amount of cash that is, that is tied up. So as you, as you grow, if you, can, if you don't get control of this cash conversion cycle, then you are just going to need more and more cash the faster that you grow. So your overdraft will effectively get bigger before it gets better. So how can we, how can we use that um, to actually make a difference to our, to our business? So it's certainly important to keep an eye on the cash and monitoring those cash changes frequently and 
ideally daily, it may not be practical for all of us, but ideally daily is, is where we need to go. You need, you need to have yourself or have someone else report on the changes in your cash balance frequently. Cross-check that with accounts receivable and payables also. And so people owe you money and people you owe money to. And a growing business should ideally set aside time each month, probably at your management meetings. And if you don't have management meetings, then that might be something you want to think about doing. Even if, even if you're a business of one, it's worth having effectively a board meeting with yourself once a month. But if you look each month at ways to, and you brainstorm ways to improve these components of the cash flow cycle, then, um, then you're likely to actually come up with ways to make improvements. And typically, those improvements will fall into three general areas. There'll either be ways that you can speed things up and sh shorten cycle times. So that would be the first one. There may be ways that you can eliminate mistakes or having to do things twice. And you may find ways where you can change the business model, and that might be ways to actually bring payments forward, for example. So let's have a look at, at this, the first of the tools that I was talking about that goes along with that cash conversion cycle. And this is just a framework, really, to allow you to look at the, the, the different parts of that cycle and to think of ways that you might be able to improve them. So we've simply listed the, the, the four cycles there, the sales cycle, the make, produce cycle, the delivery cycle, and the building the payment cycle. And you can see there, you can just brainstorm some ideas and look at them as ways to shorten the cycle, cut errors, or change the, change the model. Now, it's easy to look at things like this and, and, and be trapped into the way of thinking that um, you know, we can't, can't use this in our business or can't change that in our industry, wouldn't, wouldn't work. But just ask yourself the questions along, along the lines of what, what if, you know, if only we could, if only we could change that and then, then you might actually start to be able to come up with some ideas to, to help make a difference. So some ideas to get started. And these are just simply top, top line type, type, type ideas. So, you know, if you want to get paid sooner, ask. It sounds a really simple thing and it is a really simple thing, but think about friendly reminders, maybe even before the due date. Uh, on the, on the invoice. Don't restrict yourself to invoicing just once a month. In some businesses, why not, why not think about more frequent invoicing and, and why give them why give them 30 day terms? Certainly why invoice once a month? If you did the work at the beginning of the month, invoice at the end of the month and then give them 30 days, if you imagine the payment cycle on that, um, why have the cash in their bank account when it could be in your in your bank account? In some, some of us might be able to encourage some form of prepayment. Well, work for all of our businesses, but maybe deposit, perhaps staking payments. If you're going to do, uh, if you're going to do uh, six weeks worth of work, perhaps, perhaps there are some stages that you can split that into, and think about invoicing at the various stages. Think about automated payments. If you've got a, if you've got certainly if you've got a recurring business model, uh, if there. Are, or, or if it is a, a long project split over several months, then again, perhaps you can actually set up some kind of automated re automated payment. And Go Carless is simply one example of that, which I know a number of a number of businesses uh, businesses use. If customers are paying late, and we all have a few of those, then the first thing perhaps is to understand why it might be that there's something fairly simple, or maybe the invoice isn't done in quite the right way, maybe you haven't got quite the right code on it, and certainly if you're dealing with the public sector um, and perhaps some bigger organizations as, as your clients, then they need these things to be done in a, in a, in a certain way. And whilst you may think you're, think you're doing it, sometimes the payments get stuck, it's just simply um, because of that it's not easy for somebody in the accounts department to just tick the box and, uh, and get it paid. And whilst Paying generally for things on credit card is not a good idea. Certainly, wouldn't recommend building up any kind of balance on your on your, on your credit card. But actually, if you if you as long as you pay it off each month, then this can be a, a good way of giving you effectively a, a, a more cash in the bank, reducing the amount that you're that you're that you're paying out, and effectively moving that tidal wave a month further further back, 30, 30 days. 30 days further back or so. So those are just all some ideas to get you started with cash 
is is tricky in your business right now, if it's tight, or if you are, as I say, if you are growing or you're planning on having a push on growth, then you want to get some get your cash uh, in control early on. And these are only just some top line ideas. You're probably in in ten or twenty minutes of brainstorming, you'll probably come up with some things that are much much more applicable to your business. So, can, a focus on those can, is is definitely important. Don't forget also that, of course, improving the margins within the business will also improve our cash flow. Common, common sense, but uh, we need to consider the ways to improve the margins and consider some key financial levers. And basically, there are seven, no matter what kind of business we're in, there are about seven basic financial levers. And if we focus on these combined with the earlier ideas on the cash cycle, then uh, then we can make a huge difference to the cash in the business. And we're not necessarily talking about making huge step changes. Sometimes just a small change in each of these levers will make, uh, make a significant difference overall. And we often, in, in Bismarck, we often refer to this as the power of small change. And Vern Harnish, going back to Vern Harnish and the Gazelles team, they call it the power of one, and they're referring effectively to 1% changes. And Mazda used this idea uh, in their production process when they challenged themselves on making a 1% improvement in each step for the production. Uh, for, it was for a reduction in weight program, actually, this rather than cash, uh, but for the new X5. And they looked at every single component and challenged each, every component to make a 1% reduction in the, in the weight. And overall, uh, they ended up saving in excess of 100 kilograms over the whole weight of the car. So, what are those? What are those financial levers? The first one is is price or average spend. Try not to think about the obvious. I mean, certainly you can increase your price, and that is generally a good thing to do. And we'll come on to that in a, in a moment. But it doesn't have to be just as simple as just increasing your headline rate. It might be that you can upsell additional uh, additional products. You might be able to bundle. Uh, with it within that to increase your average order value. So if you, if you think about it as the average spend rather than necessarily a straight price, that's what we're what we're looking at there. Volume is the next one. Clearly, increasing number of leads, absolutely here. But this, this is not just simply about increasing your marketing budget and trying to get more leads in or doing something different from your, from your lead generation. That is clearly a big part of it. But think about, it, it is about increasing the number of existing customers, but also think about the frequency that they are purchasing. Um, clearly, if you can get them to keep coming back more often, then that's going to increase the overall or volume. So what are you doing with your existing customers, for example, to get them to come back and buy again? Cost of goods is the next one. What can we do to, to impact on the cost of goods and reduce those costs? Operating expenses, so your overheads, that kind of that kind of thing. Generally, with most of most of the businesses that we work with, this is not a huge area because we don't tend to small businesses to spend a huge amount on operating expenses. There might be some savings that we can make there, but uh, generally, that's um, that's not a huge area to to focus on. So you want to keep control of. So the accounts receivable. So this we were talking about the cash flow cycle before. So um, uh, how much your how much you're owed effectively, how quickly you get people to pay you. There's certainly this work in progress uh, that we talked about in the cash cycle and the accounts payable. So how often are you, how quickly are you paying? Now again, you may not want to, you may not want to lengthen that cycle too long, but of course the slower that you pay people, the better the cash is in, is in your business. So I'm not suggesting that you should start paying people late, but maybe if some of us tend to get the invoice in and pay it straight away, maybe maybe just think about setting the date for when that's going to go through if you use banks or whatever you do for your payments and actually do it closer towards whenever it is that they're asking you for that for that payment. So keeping those things in balance is, is good. But if you so if you if you if you back up the brainstorming on these on these levers by trying to pick perhaps one cash improvement strategy each quarter, you can and have a have a quarterly focus on something. Then you're going to be well on the way to building a business that's got good cash flow management within it and, it and that is capable of scaling. So these are not necessarily one-off exercises. These are things that you keep coming back to because your business will change over time and you'll be able to impact on different things over time. 
So I just want to give you a little bit of an idea of this of this power of small small change. So again, just some more examples. How can we increase average spend? I've already talked about add-on sales and upgrades. You might want to think about scripts. It may or may not be appropriate within your business. Upscaling and training your up sorry upskilling and training your salespeople certainly is a, is a is a key thing that you might want to do for, for increasing that and perhaps using things like sales checklists you might want to build a, a, a retainer model so that people are, are on that uh, on a subscription type model or automatic customer they're, 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 either they're paying monthly for whatever it is your, your services or, or your product is and yes you might want to look at increasing your prices and you can think about that in terms of maybe a, a premium product service so if you're anxious about actually increasing your basic price if you're in a very uh, cost very price competitive uh, sector then maybe there's a premium product or service that you could think about doing and, and, and typically um, people believe that about 20 percent of customers will be open potentially for a, for a premium product type service where that means that they get to the front of the line quicker or they get some extra level of service that, uh, that people wouldn't, wouldn't normally have so just some ideas there but again a few minutes brainstorming on your business and you'll almost certainly come up with um, some more specific ideas for, for your business but I want to have a quick look at the price side of things because quite often an objection that we get if we talk about raising price is the concern that uh, the business would lose customers and it's a it's certainly a concern that that we would share and that you should be right to consider however I just want to go through some numbers to just illustrate the importance of this because if we go back to the question right at the very beginning as to what's more important your, your turnover your profit or your or your cash then let's have a let's have a look at this if we and, and, it, and I know we just I've just thrown up some numbers there but if we just take that first column as where we are now so we've got a business where we've got we're selling something for 10 pounds each one of them we're selling for 10 pounds it costs us seven pounds to make we sell 10 of them in, in whatever period let's just say it's a year so our sales are 100 pounds uh, our cost of goods is is therefore 70 pounds so our gross profit is therefore 30 pounds and if we've got a fixed cost of 20 pounds our net profit is 10 pounds so at the end of the day on our turnover or our sales of 100 pounds we're making a 10 pound profit so we've got a 10 percent profit we now look at the second column and we say well let's what if we increased our prices by 20 percent and everything else stayed the same in terms of we still sold 10 so that's this is a this is the dream scenario right what happens well if that if that happened then all of that increase in the price flows straight through to the bottom line so for a, we've now got a 30 pound um, net profit so for the same volume we're, we're not spending any more on, um, on on cost of goods because we haven't sold any more units we haven't increased our overheads in any way we've simply raised the price and we've had a 300% increase in our in our profits now as I said that's the ideal side that assumes you don't lose any customers so the question is how many customers could we afford to lose if we, if we do that and make the same profit and if you work these numbers through you'll see that you can actually if you if you lost four customers so if you lost 40 percent of your customers by raising your price by 20 percent you would still be in the same position as you were before you raised your price now actually what would probably happen with that is that you even if that was the, the case, I mean, you wouldn't lose, by the way, 40%. Almost, I could almost guarantee you, apart from one or two really, really tight markets, but I could almost guarantee you that you would not lose anything like 40% of your customers. Um, so the chances are you're going to be in a better position by doing that. And even if you, if you do drop your volume a little bit, how important is that is that to you versus the profit? And actually, if you've dropped your volume, maybe that would mean that there's perhaps a few more hours in the day uh, for you to pick up some more more customers but the right kind of customers so have a have a think about that um, because it is certainly certainly something that is worth considering and you know it doesn't have to be 20 percent it might be might be 10 percent or whatever it might be but typically most of us don't look at changing our pricing structure very often at all um, and, and we're leaving potential money on the table so let's look at the next one in terms of the power of small change 
how can we increase the volume or the frequency and or the frequency of, of purchase or LinkedIn together. So just some examples again, they're just ideas to get you started. They're not things that I'm saying you should do, they're just ideas to get you started and, and hopefully again you'll spend a bit of time and you'll think up some things that are much more relevant to your business. But simply maintaining a customer base to enable you to keep in regular contact with your customers will help. When we come back to the reasons why customers leave businesses, generally of all the reasons, price is about 15% of the time that people leave, but lack of contact, lack of lack of customer service, but certainly lack of contact, lack of people believing that you care if you like about the customer, is something like 67% from the last data that, that I saw. So that's an absolutely key thing for retaining customers, but also if you're trying to increase the frequency of purchase, clearly it's key. Are there ways that you could reward loyalty um, that perhaps don't cost you too much money, but, but ways that you can you can increase the loyalty of a customer. Can you segment your customers and have slightly different offerings for, for those customers and make it more more relevant and tailored to the different uh, different types of customers that you might have? Are there add-ons or additional products or services that you might well be able to offer um, that you can upsell or that they, people will come back for, for more of? Um, can you can you can you build uh, if you're running a service type, type, type business and you do maybe an ad hoc one piece of work, can you build in uh, a contact at six month point or, or at the year point or something automatically into that price or, or, or automatically into your contract that allows you to effectively have sold a, an extra bit of a, a repeat and clearly differentiate. I mean, that's you know, just, a, just a word on the, on the slide here, but, but again, the more that you can differentiate to, from, your, from your competitors, then the more likely you are to increase your frequency of purchase. So these are things that you could start to look at and think about, but as I say, make some more that are much more specific perhaps to your, to your business. So, Some more numbers, mum, numbers for you, just to just to wrap up, really, but just to see how this might affect. I'm not going to go through each of those uh, seven levers and, and propose some ideas for those, but let's just have a look at the effect on a potential business if you were to do this. So the power of small change. So if we if we were able, if we had a business that started off with with these numbers, so just over three hundred thousand pound turnover, sixty percent gross, six uh, percent cost of cost of sales, overheads leading down to a net profit on EBIT and for interest and tax of just over 10,000, so a 3.4% profit. If, if we do what we said we've just looked at doing and we try and get 10% improvements in these, these areas, just bear with me on, on this for, for a little bit, then if we, can do, uh, if we can do that on the price, the frequency and the volume, then there's a significant uplift in the, in the sales that are, that are possible there. If we can reduce our cost of sales by 10% as well, then we're now looking at a 54% cost of sales instead of uh, 60%. And if we can reduce our overheads by 10% as well, then we're going to save ourselves roughly 6,000. Well, in fact, that's not even quite, quite 10%, is it? We've, we've, saved, we've saved on there, so a little bit less than that. So that overall is going to lead to now, instead of just over ten thousand pounds or ten and a half thousand pounds net profit, we're looking at potentially an eighty-one thousand net net profit. So an eight hundred percent increase in profit, or going up from three point four percent margin to twenty percent. Now, this is a mix of a hypothetical example and with a little bit of um, actual in here. But it, but I'm not saying for one moment that you're going to be able to get ten percent easily across all of those aspects of your business. I'm simply trying to illustrate a point which is that by focusing on each of these seven levers and by looking for a small percentage increase in each of these, you can make an enormous difference to the bottom line of your business, which if you, again, whether you're trying to take the profits out of your business and just for cash for yourself, or whether you're trying to scale that business and, and, and build, build it into, into something even bigger, then the cash is going to be hugely important. And, Whilst this is for, this is the bit focusing on the margins, so this combined with the cash stuff that we talked about earlier will have a huge effect on the retained profits and the cash within your business. So just to just to just to sum up, really, um, if you if you do this brainstorming and you and you pick one cash improvement 
strategy per quarter, so you have a 90 day focus on it, then you will be well on the way to building a business that's got great cash flow management and is capable of scaling. And if you get yourself in that routine and you actually make this work, then that's going to set you free to grow. And who knows, you might even sleep better at night as well. So that's all I wanted to say, I think, today. So uh, thank you very much for that. Come on. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Great. Um, thank you, Kevin. Let's see if there's some questions that are coming through right now. Um, the first one is from Paul, and he asks, what financial uh, metrics should I put in place to be measuring in our business? Okay, Paul, good. Good question. Thank you. And those of you that have worked with this might know that we're very keen on setting key performance indicators that um, not, not loads of them, but a, but a handful that are really important to look at in our business. And obviously, the cash side of things, the financial metrics, are very important. So you could do a lot worse than actually looking at those those seven levers um, and and basing some key key performance indicators around those. So so around around the sales and if you're going to look at price, you're going to look at price increasing, look at how many what percentage of the customers you've actually achieved that price increase with. Um, look at look at the look at the frequency side of things, look at the margin. So if you if you just go back through these slides afterwards and you look at those seven levers and you've set yourself some of those some of the brainstorming ways that you're going to achieve those, they're great things to start off as your as your KPIs. So I think those would be the those are the key things. And if you combine that with looking at your cash conversion cycle and looking at days that you can uh, where you looking at ways that you can save days or, or on, on those cash conversion cycles. So certainly things like your accounts receivable, key one, accounts payable going along, alongside with that. Um, but if you also look at the, the other cycles of your business, try thinking of ways to shorten those and then measuring measuring those. So I hope that answers your question, Paul. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We've got another question from Stuart and he asks, um, do we really have to check our cash every day? All right. As I hinted, um, I think early earlier on, that's the ideal. And to be perfectly frank, I don't want to cash in in my business every day. So the answer is no, you don't have to. However, what you do, you do what you do want to do is find the frequency that works for you, because we don't want to spend all of our time analysing numbers. But equally, we know cash is incredibly important. So it entirely really depends on the size of your business and how much visibility you've got on the transactions that are going through. So if you're running a fast uh, fast churn business and things are changing every every day and you've got a lot of costs coming in and going out, then it might be that you do need to, to measure it daily and report on any exceptions there. Um, if, if your turnover is a bit smaller, a bit slower, things are, the churn is, 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 is lower, then it might be that you could do it even monthly at the outside, but I would certainly wouldn't recommend any any less than that. And I was at a session not so long ago um, where Ivan Meisner, who's the the gentleman that set up BNI internationally and has grown it from being business out of his garage to a, a, a global business in I think 65 countries with 200 and something thousand members all all across the world. He looks at his numbers every day, and that includes his cash, but it includes some of the other key metrics. So he knows every single day how many members they've lost and how many they've, they've gained. And if somebody like that um, believes it's important to keep on top of their numbers, then I think um, that lesson should apply really to all of us. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got another question from Nick, and he asks, um, what is the typical return on investment should we look for when investing in our business? Okay, thank, thank you, Nick. So that is a that is a very interesting question and, uh, and, a, and a, a tricky one to answer because there is no there is no right answer for that. So typical ROI. What what, you, what bigger companies will do is they will look for a rate of return, an internal rate of return, it's called the IRR, and they will set that and they will. If anybody is looking to invest in terms of spend money from within the business on, on new projects or whatever else, they will have to get over that 
that rate is sometimes called a hurdle rate internally as well. And they will, the company, the, the bigger company, will set that internally. And it might be 17%, it might be 20%, or something like that. But the point is not so much the number, because the thing to consider is what else would you do with that money? So if, if I said to you that the bank interest rates now have miraculously gone up to 10% and you could get 10% of your money by putting it in the bank and you came to me with a, with a, with a project to spend out some money that I might get 10% back in, you'd say I'd be mad, I might as well just take the money in the, in the bank, there's no risk to it all. Well, very little risk to it, perhaps you might argue. With interest rates being as they are very low at the moment, a 10% interest rate might look quite attractive. So if you come, if you, if you think you're going to get 10% return on your money and the risk isn't too great, it might be worth doing. So that's the thing to consider for us as smaller businesses: is what else would we do with that with that money? What are the what are the risks of us not getting the return that we want? But if we think on average we're going to get a 12% return, is that better? better use of that money than I could do somewhere somewhere else. And you need to make that decision really. We need to make that individually for our own business. So there's no one number, Nick, that I think is the right number. Hope that helps. Great. Okay. I think those are all the questions for you today. Thank you again, Kevin, for hosting today's webinar. I will be sending out a copy of the presentation and Kevin's contact details out to you all shortly. But before we close, just a quick reminder, this webinar is part of our service to our Smart Room members. If you are not already a member or a Biz Smart client and would like to access our archives of webinars, then please visit our website, biz-smart.co.uk, and go to the Smart Room page. We hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you for joining us and for listening today. Thank you very much.